stillbirth is death of the baby after 20 weeks of pregnancy. In developed countries like Australia, this occurs in one in 200 pregnancies and it is even more common in developing countries. This is 40 times more common than sudden infant death syndrome. In developed countries, the rates of stillbirth have remained largely unchanged for the past 20 years. In most cases, the cause of stillbirth is unknown, although it is more common in smokers, in women with diabetes, and in cases where there is slow growth of the baby. Usually, the dead baby looks completely normal. Lack of knowledge for the exact cause of stillbirth is extremely frustrating for the distraught parents and of course makes predicting this devastating outcome extremely difficult. Recent data shows that the likelihood of stillbirth increases as the pregnancy goes along. However, stillbirth can also occur at any stage of pregnancy. This pattern of increasing risk of stillbirth with gestation suggests a cause for stillbirth. It raises the possibility that stillbirth is due to aging of the placenta, the organ that transports nutrients from the mother to the baby and waste products from the baby to the mother. But what is aging? It's a process in which the likelihood of death increases with time. By this definition, stillbirth is frequently associated with aging. Why should aging occur in the placenta when pregnancy only lasts nine months and yet humans can live to be over a hundred years? To understand the answer to this question, we need to understand more about the process of aging. Different plants and animals live for different lengths of time and this is related to their life history strategy. This is linked to their processes of reproduction. Once genes have been passed on to offspring, it becomes less important for the adults to survive. Further, genes that cause aging related changes can be preserved in the population as long as their negative effects occur only after reproduction has already occurred. An extreme example is Huntington's career, which may actually improve reproductive success prior to the onset of the devastating neurological consequences of the gene, but only after the gene has already been passed on to the offspring. There may be many similar genes in the human genome that cause the negative effects of aging, but positive effects earlier in life, allowing the genes to be passed on. With this in mind, let us turn back to the placenta. A key question now becomes, how long does the placenta have to work to allow the birth of a normal live baby at the end of pregnancy, which can carry on the mother's genes in a new generation. If we look at data from countries with low levels of medical intervention, like Nigeria, we see that 95% of babies have already been born by 41 weeks of pregnancy. This means that if a gene causes deterioration in placental function after 41 weeks of pregnancy, it will have little effect on the survival of the babies in the population and will therefore be retained within the population just like the gene for Huntington's chorea. Therefore, we should expect to see signs of aging in the placenta after 41 weeks of pregnancy. How can we search for signs of aging in the placenta? Well, the first step is to look for the changes associated with aging in other tissues. Studies of placentas associated with stillbirth do show many of the changes 
associated with aging. 91% show thickening of blood vessel walls. 54% show areas of infarction or dead placenta. 14% show blocked blood vessels and 10% show areas of calcification. These are all changes that are seen in other organs such as the brain, heart and kidney in old age. What about biochemical and histological signs of aging? One of the key mediators of damage to cells in aging are highly reactive species of molecules called free radicals. Free radicals are produced by many cells within the body and there are processes to block their damaging effects. However, with time, those blocking mechanisms can weaken, allowing damage to the cells. Free radicals can damage many of the cell's contents, including the DNA. The DNA is arranged into chromosomes and the ends of chromosomes are called telomeres. These telomeres are rich in the DNA residues called guanosine and cytosine. These two residues are particularly vulnerable to oxidation by reactive free radicals. We have compared the length of telomeres in tissue coming from the placenta at 38 weeks with tissue coming from placentas at 41 weeks. We observed a shortening of the telomeres in the placentas delivered late. This is consistent with placental aging. We also observed an increase in the oxidation of the DNA. This is detected by measuring 8-hydroxyguanosine in the cell layer on the surface of the placenta called the syncytiotrophoblast. The oxidized DNA is shown as pink. The changes in oxidation of the DNA were observed in placentas associated with stillbirth. Oxidation can also affect the lipids within the cell. One of the main lipids that can undergo oxidation is the lipid on the surface of the intracellular organelles known as autophagosomes. These are particles that are central to the cellular recycling system. They collect damaged mitochondria and proteins. The autophagosomes then fuse with lysosomes, which contain acids and enzymes that break the damaged contents of the autophagosome down into their constituents and release them for recycling. Our studies showed that the lipid on the surface of the autophagosomes in late deliveries and those associated with stillbirth can become oxidized to the lipid for hydroxy non -inel. We have also shown that an enzyme called aldehyde oxidase that can cause oxidation of lipids is high in placentas from late deliveries and stillbirths. The oxidation of the lipid surface of the autophagosome seems to interfere with the fusion of the lysosomes with the autophagosomes. Lysosomes occur in the placental cells known as the syncytiotrophoblast. Normally the lysosomes are present just under the surface of these cells that is in contact with the maternal blood. However, in the late delivering placenta and the placentas from stillbirths, they fill the whole of the cell. At the same time, the autophagosomes get larger as their cargoes 
grow in size. Using small pieces of placental tissue cultured in the laboratory known as explants, we have replicated the changes observed in the stillbirth placentas by removing growth factors. These explants show increased lipid oxidation and accumulation of large autophagosomes, just as we see with stillbirth. Excitingly, we can prevent these effects using raloxifene, a drug which blocks the action of the enzyme aldehyde oxidase. Increases in the enzyme mTOR have been associated with aging in many tissues. In the placenta late in gestation, this enzyme also increases in activity as measured by phosphorylation of its substrate P70S6 kinase. The mTOR associates with the surface of the lysosomes and blocks lysosomal function. This may be a further mechanism leading to the accumulation of autophagosomes late in pregnancy and in stillbirth. Patients with Alzheimer's disease show similar changes in 4-hydroxy nonenal, 8-hydroxy guanosine and P70S6 kinase within the brain as we have observed in the aging placenta. Together these data indicate that at the end of pregnancy, just when the growing fetus is demanding more resources, the source of those resources, the placenta, is aging due to the effects of increased free radicals causing oxidation of lipids and DNA. The aging placenta likely has impaired transport abilities. This mismatch between the demands of the baby and the ability of the placenta to meet those demands likely leads to increased levels of carbon dioxide and acid within the baby and low levels of oxygen and consequently fetal death. We are currently developing strategies to identify the aging of the placenta to allow intervention to deliver the baby while it is still alive. And by understanding the processes that lead to aging in the placenta, we may be able to develop ways to keep it healthy for longer, allowing the baby to grow and thrive.